by the time the morning got there, I had to take a picture of a before and after because I was so proud of this tent I had put up the night before. Uh, I had to pick, take a picture of it. Well, the before and after picture of the picture of the tent was something else. It looked like the before and after picture was, you know, before meth and after meth. This was my tent after meth. <laughs> Welcome to Deviate with Rolf Potts, where I talk with experts, public figures, and interesting people about fascinating topics that meander off topic. Today I talk about the joys of traveling on foot, that is, trekking from place to place in faraway countries. And this has become an obsession of sorts for me lately, and when you obsess about something, it feels like you begin to hear about it everywhere, places like this. The world reveals itself to those who travel on foot. Nothing else does with such clarity and such transparency, nothing, nothing. And yet nobody uh, travels on foot. That was filmmaker Werner Herzog being interviewed for the Portal podcast. The interview wasn't about hiking, but the topic came up in a way that caught my attention. Because traveling on foot has been on my mind in recent months, I've set up a couple of episodes on the topic this season. In today's episode, I talk with Forrest Mallard of Trampasaurus Treks, which is a travel community that aims to promote hiking as an affordable and accessible travel option. Now, I've known Forrest for more than 15 years now. When my book Vagabonding first came out in 2003, he was one of the first people to contact me and tell me about his travel dreams. He set off on his own vagabonding journey in 2005, and he's still going strong. I actually interviewed him earlier this year when I was traveling through Dubai, and since then he's trekked to places like Pakistan and Spain and Italy, and the last I heard from him he was in Austria. What I like about Forrest is that he's a pretty normal guy who's fallen in love with trekking. He's not an endurance athlete with equipment sponsors, but just a guy who loves to travel on foot because it allows him to live in a richer and more immersive way. As you'll hear, trekking didn't necessarily come easy for him, but it was through difficult experiences on the trail that he was able to appreciate the simple joys of walking. In the course of our conversation, Forrest and I talk about how he left his dream job in New York to travel the world. We talk about the advantages trekking offers over urban sightseeing and how European hiking differs from backcountry treks in North America. We talk about classic walks in Europe like the Camino de Santiago in Spain and the West Highland Way in Scotland and the Slovenian Alps and how these are classic travel experiences on par with, say, taking the Trans-Siberian Railroad across Russia or diving the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. We talk about how travel on foot is way cheaper than other kinds of independent travel and in general our conversation aims to put some great ideas in your head if trekking is something that you've considered but not quite done yet. This episode is brought to you by Airtrex, the online flight planning service that allows you to design affordable multi-stop itineraries for vagabonding journeys. As I've said before, half the fun of Airtrex is just using their flight planning tools to tinker around and dream about travel. So do go to Airtrex.com and plug in some hypothetical routes for your dream trips and see how much cheaper and easier it can be than you might have thought. This episode is also brought to you by Tortuga, which makes backpacks and backpack accessories for vagabonding travel. You know, in the interview, Forrest and I talk about how there are many places in Europe where you can hike without a sleeping bag and a tent and just sleep in huts or hostels or village guest houses, which means you could spend a month on the trail with a lightweight pack like the Tortuga set out. Check out the set out and other packs at rolfpotts.com slash Tortuga. And if you see something you like, you can get 10% off all your orders with the promo code DEVIATE. All right, here's a one-hour deep dive into the joys of traveling on foot. You're one of the first people that got in touch with me after I wrote Vagabonding. Really? How many years ago was it that you were... um, Well, probably I left the States in 2005, so it was probably around 2003, 2004. Yeah, the book came out in 2003. Okay. So... uh, (laughs) Um, as far as... I didn't uh, know I was one of your first um, converts, well, one of your first disciples. Well, you're one of the first guys who said, come see me, you know, I love your book, come, let's let's hang out. And At so, the time I had something to offer, I was kind of like the kingpin of club promotion in New York City. I had worked on Broadway for 11 years. So I probably wouldn't have said, come see me if I hadn't had something to offer you if you got when you got to New York. So I could take you backstage at all the Broadway theaters and I could walk you into any nightclub in New York, pretty much. So 
yeah, I think that having that kind of res- those resources allowed me to say, hey, come and see me, because um, uh, you opened my eyes to actually the possibility of taking off and not looking back. Uh, so I wanted to kind of repay that by showing you my New York in a way. Yeah. And I met a lot of Broadway famous people who I didn't know, but were Broadway <laughs> famous. Right. Um, and I think it's interesting that you, you that you say that um, you know that, that you characterize travel as something that you suddenly realized you could do because you since that time in the last fifteen years you've really been doing it. Well, I re- well obviously I was already interested in travel when I found vagabonding because it was in the travel section. So um, I think at one point. Uh, in my life in New York, I had moved there to work on Broadway. That was a dream. Uh, I had checked that off. Um, and, um, you know, I was going through a lot of, you know, personal problems. And I think anyone that actually is a nomad at heart, once they're in one place for too long, they start to get itchy. So I uh, started looking into the travel section and I found vagabonding um, because I did want to just, uh, that was in my head, I did want to just kind of leave and just keep going. Uh, And that was amazing that I had found a book that was written specifically for that ideal. And so, yes, I, I, I read the book. And interestingly enough, I was working for the number one nightclub in the world at that time, Crowbar. And they had just given me a raise that week after my one year anniversary. And at that same time that they gave me the raise and said, hey, great job. I told them I needed, I wanted to leave. (laughs) 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 So I still remember the, the shock, uh, that, that, uh, uh, and we're, we're friends again, but uh, they were kind of, you know, insulted at that point. Um, uh, but we're still, we're Facebook friends again, uh, and they kind of enjoy my travels, uh, at this point. Um, and, but yes, I left and it took me a year to finally get on the plane after deciding I wanted to leave. And in 2005, I left and, uh, have only briefly been back to the States once. I think it's interesting that there are certain... You know, you have the most successful bar in the world, and so there's this assumption that you would have, you would like, there's nothing better that could happen to you in the world than getting the promotion from them. Um, yet, you'd embraced an, a new way of thinking. It's obviously still suffusing your way of being in the world. Sure. It's like the, <clears throat> it's not just the fact that it was a new way of thinking. I, I, I obviously, um, had become uh, itchy to travel. And the fact that I would have stayed in New York and stayed at that job uh, after knowing what I really wanted to do, it would have just made me unhappy. It would have made me um, regret staying in a thing, staying in a place where I, when I knew that my heart was going someplace else. And that's when I really start to get self-destructive and that's when I start being miserable uh, and maybe a little, um, you know, depressed because my heart wouldn't be in it. And when you do, th- I think, chase your dreams and you're allowed to kind of pursue your passion, that's when you're the most happy and the most joyful. And so. Uh, I know everybody doesn't have the option to just quit and 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 chase their dreams, uh, but I had nothing holding me back, and I just did it. Well, I want to skip ahead a little bit because I've I've sort of been following you from afar for a long time, and it seems like the kind of travel that you have really embraced is slow travel, but like literally walking pace travel. Right. And I want to, I want to go back a little bit and talk about sort of your epiphany, what you led this in this direction. But before we contextualize everything, what's, what's the argument for why walking is the best way to travel? 
Um, it's, uh, how can I say this? It's a, if you eat your food, uh, if you, if you go to the most expensive restaurant and you're paying $600 for a, uh, an amazing steak, uh, do you cut it into cubes and swallow it whole or do you chew it and savor it? And literally, this is an analogy I'm making up on the spot. <laughs> I like it, I like it. So, um, I like to chew slow and, and taste it and savor all the flavors uh, before I start digesting it. And I think it's the same exact way with walking to, for me. Um, it is a way to to travel in the most literal sense. You're you're actually feeling the distance between point A to point B, and every single step is uh, a realization of how far things are apart from each other. And you know this can more easily be done in I think Eastern Europe, where where their villages are so close together. Um, but the, uh, the feeling of accomplishment, the feeling of soaking up every little bit of, uh, the culture, it doesn't happen only in the major cities where, uh, the culture is often canned for tourist consumption. It's, uh, it's more real in between those, uh, uh, touristy hotspots. And you'll meet the most you'll you'll meet the most um, hospitable people in between those tourist hotspots that are interested in who you are and why you're walking and uh, why you're choosing to be in their little village where and they might only see a few tourists a year. It's interesting how so much of travel is geared toward efficiency and the fact that people have don't have much time, right? And so you have the big town tourist model um, where things are based on attractions, air quote attractions, right? which are nice, but then you get people who they've, they've seen 20 tourists this week or, they've, they've, uh, or the tourists they meet are in too much of a hurry to truly appreciate things. And so how does walking... Um, make this better for the guest and for the for the host how, do, how does it increase the the meaningfulness of the experience well there is uh, i i as i'm you know trying to start developing my own blog and my 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 own style of uh, travel i'm trying to focus on two types of walking trips one would be you know the trek, which would be between cities, countries, continents. The other one would be just urban exploring, walking around a city, finding the cool things. Uh, but more often than not, it's not those those attractions. Those attractions, I think, are great to check off the list. Um, but mostly in the Western European and American uh, destinations, uh, I think they probably the most obvious example would be the Eiffel Tower or, you know, the Mona Lisa or something like that. The, you, you have an image of your mind and you want to go to this place and you check it off. But after you check it off, um, there's no story about this Eiffel Tower. Then there's no camera shot from any angle that you're going to take that's unique and hasn't been done before. Um, with walking, uh, there are a lot of attractions and a lot of uh, things that you are able to see that may not be as grand and magnificent as the Eiffel Tower, but the fact that you don't discover them until you get there, and until you see them in person, um, is a little bit more exciting and sometimes because it's a feeling of discovery. Uh, it's a feeling of exploring, and you you um, uh, you get to embrace uh, a sudden knowledge of uh, history and historical events 
um, that you're learning on your path, on your journey. It's interesting that you bring Paris as an example because I teach a class there every summer. And there's a couple of things that pop into my head. Well, actually, there's, there's three things. One is the idea of walk until your day becomes interesting, which is an old vagabonding okay. principle. This is not specific to Paris. Um, but one is the idea of the flaneur. Are you familiar with the idea no. of the flaneur? Um, the flaneur it actually came out of Paris in the 19th century. Um, and it's this idea that we're so, we're so constricted by practicality uh, and by our own goals that maybe walking um, in search of experience, not really having a goal, but walking until your day becomes interesting, walking until you, you discover what you actually had been out to walk for uh, reveals itself. Uh, that's something I, I actively teach in my Paris class because people come and they, they, they're interested in, in the Eiffel Tower, they're interested in the Mona Lisa, all the things they think they're supposed to see. And they don't realize that there's this tradition, it's over 100 years old, where you just, you walk until maybe it's some beautiful little green pebble, you know, in, 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 mm -hmm. in, in the path that you find that interests you. Um, and that's, that was the point of your walk, not necessarily what you thought your walk uh, was supposed to be about. And then one other example I, I'm thinking of is before I wrote my book Souvenir, I walked around the fifth arrondissement of Paris. Have you spent much time in Paris? I've never been to France. Okay. Other than the border of France and Spain where I started the Camino Santiago. Which I want to get to. I want to hear about your, your sure. uh, Camino story. Um, but And you really have something to look forward to when, in terms of, of having France as a place to go to. But in forcing myself to walk through every street of the fifth arrondissement of Paris, it was sort of like the anti-flaneur. Instead of just walking and until experience happened, I forced myself to walk every single street in one neighborhood. And suddenly I was seeing things, I was seeing buildings, I was seeing scenes that I um, didn't, I hadn't noticed that were there, you know, that as I was looking for inspiration or whatever, um, I was missing these these interesting and concrete and exciting real parts of the neighborhood. And so I think walking, like I don't know if I'm as invested in walking as you are, um, but somehow walking has given me some of my best metaphors as a traveler. I think that what I had no concept of and what most people might not realize is that as you're walking, you, you, you picture yourself in these mountains and you're just going to be enjoying this mountainside and the, the fields and the wildlife and the occasional sighting of some farm worker or more often than not cows and sheep uh, that you talk to uh, <laughs> by habit just for conversation. Okay. <laughs> but um, what... I didn't realize, and what's become such a major uh, revelation is uh, how much meditation is you're kind of forced to do as you're walking. And uh, just in a, a short, you know, seven day walk, and uh, uh, obviously more if you're doing like a whole month transcontinental, uh, trans. Uh, international walk, um, you start thinking about things you haven't thought of in years. And uh, you, and as you're saying that walks open your mind to uh, in a more, for a more creative uh, thinking, um, you're, you're opening doors in your brain uh, that somehow have been closed for a long time. And I think that you think much differently as you're walking. I think that just the thought process and um, uh, the way that your brain works uh, is is it's much more active, and in its in a, in, a, and in a way, it's its own form of meditation. What, what's an example of um, a place where you've gone walking and you've sort of surprised yourself by? being able to think in a, in a whole new vein or think of things um, in ways you hadn't thought of before? Well, I think the obvious 
one is um, is the Camino de Santiago because it's um, as you walk the Camino de Santiago, there are several people that had mentioned to me it's broken down into three parts. The first part is physical because that's when your body hurts. The second part, uh, which goes through the plains of the Mazetta, is just a long, straight dirt road, pretty much through fields that doesn't turn, there's no hills, uh, and there's nothing really around you to see. And that lasts an entire week. And during that time uh, of one week, you think about everything that's ever happened in your life. Sometimes you just want to punch yourself in the face <laughs> because you're, you're reliving something that you did that was just so stupid. Um, but it's, it's, it's a learning process, even from past, your own past experiences. And you'll write songs in your head, even though you're not a songwriter. You'll come up with poetry in your head, even if you're not a poet. Uh, and you just, you, you, your, your thinking is uh, so uh, much larger than what it normally would be. So it's like a fugue state for the brain. Yeah. Now, um, just so our listeners know, and some of them might not know, what is the Camino? And why was it important to you? Well, the Camino de Santiago is a, a historical uh, walk. It, I, I believe that even before the Catholics took it over, it was a pagan walk from across Europe to Finisterre, which is the uh, edge of Spain just above Portugal, uh, Finisterre, the end of Earth. And that would be where the pagans would walk and then they would get there and they would burn their clothes. And it was a, a form of kind of, you know, um, symbolic rebirth and all of that. So, uh, but after Christianity came around, uh, they, they built a massive cathedral in the town of Santiago. And that is where the remains of St. James is supposed to be. Am I, I think that's right, St. Yeah, James. I think Santiago yeah. is Spanish for St. James. Yeah, okay, so I'm, as a, someone that loves the Camino so much, it's kind of embarrassing to, to second, have second thoughts about that. Anyway, the, uh, in, in Santiago, they built this massive cathedral um, where the remains of, uh, supposed remains of St. James are kept. And so pilgrims from across Europe, uh, as far away as Norway, in Eastern Europe and Russia, uh, uh, for over a thousand years, have since walked to Santiago, which is in the far side of Spain. So uh, this would be the way of atonement. If you completed the walk of Santiago, um, it was um, you would your all of your sins would be forgiven. Um, now, the, the one stretch between the border of France and Santiago itself is one month. So you could imagine that if you're walking from Norway or um, some of these other places, it's six months or more. Uh, six months if you're uh, really hoofing it. Right. So some of these people were probably not as uh, healthy as some of these modern day uh, uh, pilgrims. And they probably, it probably took them quite a lot longer. Uh, so uh, why is it significant to me? The uh, Camino was just something that I had read in uh, Paulo Coelho's uh, The Pilgrimage. And when I had read it, probably more than a decade before, it was something that I really, really wanted to do. But at the time, I was living in... I think Washington DC um, and the fact that uh, there was somebody that had the luxury of having an entire month off uh, to walk the Camino de Santiago and the fact that someone had enough financial resources to walk the Camino de Santiago, that was something that I doubt that I, I, I really doubted at the time that I would ever be able to experience. How old were you at this time? Um, probably just out of the military and uh, probably around 30. Okay. You were a Marine. Like, you're, you're a South Florida guy who d 
didn't really leave South Florida, became a Marine. So Be, how did you... Because I wanted to travel. That was okay. the main reason why I joined the Marine Corps, was because I wanted to get as far away from South Florida as I possibly could. Um, Where in South Florida were you exactly? I was in Fort Lauderdale. Okay. My first hike I ever did was the March of Dimes Walkathon when I was probably like 12. It was 20 miles huh. down the beach in Fort Lauderdale. And I still remember how absolutely sore I was, and but how I couldn't wait to do it again. Why didn't you do this every weekend? <laughs> so, so walking is an early impetus for travel for you. That, that in coming back to being a, a walker, you're really I liked going back doing to an that early... urban walk. I didn't really see the connection between travel and walking at that time, because I had never been anywhere. I had never been out of the state of Florida until I joined the military. Okay. Gosh, where were we? You asked me about walking. <laughs> 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 the, the deep I get off on a tangent. Uh, well, um, it was actually, uh, you were sort of interested in the Camino, but then also there's this Glasgow, there's this Scotland trail yeah. too. Um, so your, your initial question was, when did I become interested in walking? What yeah. was the uh, sudden spark of inspiration to do that? I think I framed it as an epiphany. And right. Then you said, well, look, it's not really an epiphany. It wasn't. It was just the opportunity. It yeah. was the opportunity and the resources. Suddenly I had uh, these things available to do this walk that Paulo Coelho had written about in his book, The Pilgrimage, which I never thought I would be able to experience. So uh, here I am in Europe. I was piecing together walks suddenly. Uh, I wanted to do walks because walking is probably cheap and if I'm in one of these places that I think is going to be exorbitantly uh, expensive like Europe um, how can I stretch the money I have and were you worried about like your personal fitness or your gear or no. was it mainly just that you wanted it to go on the cheap in, in I at that time I had been working at sit-down desk jobs even while I had been staged uh, uh, um, stationed in the military uh, in New York uh, in Quito in Istanbul and in Bangkok I was behind a desk doing computer stuff so but because of my past physical prowess because of my marine background mm -hmm. I thought hey not a problem I've walked with big backs on my back but it had been a decade since then and yes I was in a lot of pain uh, the, the uh, I started the, I think that I, I wrote an entire story about my, my very first trek ever because it was, it's the typical Is first this the trek. Scotland one? Yes. It's okay. the, the West Highland way uh -huh. from Glasgow to Fort William. Uh, my bag probably weighed half a ton. It had everything in there from, uh, every little knick-knack that I thought might be cute to carry along the trail to the entire uh, Lonely Planet Europe on a shoestring, which is uh, probably like five pounds. It's crazy. It's, it's a brick. Uh, you could, you know, stop a car with this thing. Um, I had all this stuff in my bag. I hadn't really... Uh, trained for it. Um, I was wearing sandals, trekking sandals, but still sandals. And I was in Scotland, a very wet place. Um, and I hadn't purchased my tent beforehand. I hadn't purchased my sleeping bag beforehand. So I had spent over 24 hours getting to Glasgow from Dubai. And without having the rest or having a good sleep other than my my nap from London to Glasgow on the bus, um, I was so excited by seeing the archway see, uh, saying entrance to the West Highland Way. I literally could not contain myself. I was like, ah, I gotta go now, I gotta go. And so at the information booth for the West Highland Way, they sold really crappy tents and sleeping bags. Um, and you didn't have one yet. I didn't have one. I honestly hadn't thought that far ahead. Um, so I bought 
uh, an overpriced tent and an overpriced sleeping bag. I bought the maps. Uh, I bought a patch. Uh, <laughs> and I set off. Now, I set off at 4 p.m. And normally, when you're doing these things, you set off at like 7 a.m. Uh, so by the time I ended my first day, it was something like 9 p.m. or something like that. I was absolutely dead um, and could barely get my tent up. And the second day, uh, I was like, oh, I'm, but, you know, committed. I'm committed now. Uh, the second day, you hit Conic Hill. I still remember that the name of my first hill I had to walk when I was trekking uh, because pretty so far it had been flat. But now there's this mountain that you've... How many days into the trip? This is the second day. Okay. All right. And you're, you're looking at this. My legs are dead at this point because I'm carrying this excruciatingly heavy bag. Um, and I'm like, ah, they're going to walk around it. We're going to walk around this thing. And as I get closer, I see the little line of people walking up the side of the mountain. And I just started cursing. I, this was a... This was someone being an asshole, putting this mountain on the path. It was everyone's fault but mine <clears throat> because they were going to make me walk up this thing. Um, and so I got uh, up this thing and people would stop and chat with me. And then as they were walking further along, I saw that they were chatting with me out of concern because I looked horrible because they would stop and turn around and just make sure that I was still upright. But I made it up the mountain. Um, it was just as difficult coming down the other side. Uh, and then that section of the West Highland Way, actually, you're not allowed to pitch your tent and camp. You have to stay at a hotel. But I didn't... Hotels are crazy expensive. Uh, there, uh, it's For a hostel, it's, you know, 25 euros a night in a bunk. Uh, so I didn't want to just pay that. So I kept walking and kept walking and kept walking, even though I was in excruciating pain. It started to rain. I hopped the fence and I put my tent up in a uh, in an area, and then the storm came. Um, my cheap, crappy tent started to leak. Uh, I got out of the tent. I put my poncho, stretched it over the tent. Uh, the puddles started forming in the tent. I started using my clothing out of the bag to mop up and uh, empty the water out of the tent. By the time the morning got there, I had to take a picture of it before and after because I was so proud of this tent I had put up the night before. And I had to take a picture of it. Well, the, the before and after picture of the picture of the tent was something else. It looked like the before and after picture was, you know, before meth and after meth. This was my tent after meth. Um, <laughs> so, so you're like, you're a big walking guy now. That, this is your thing. But, but your, this your first walking story was, a was like a disaster after It was day a disaster. Two. How did this... Uh, well, from that nightmare of an experience, by the way, which I still enjoyed. Okay. I think I, think I always kind of... It's kind of like going to the gym. I You hate it when you're there, but... Immediately afterwards, you're like, that was awesome. It's kind of like, that's my relationship with, with trekking as well. I will wake up at 7 a.m. in the morning, 7 a.m. in the morning, and think to myself, why am I doing this? You know, like, but then you get on the trail, and you, you're, first of all, you're seeing things that are just so beautiful, and you're experiencing the meeting, meeting people and seeing things that you probably would never have seen unless you were walking but then at the end of the day, you're always thankful that you made that decision to get up and just go. Um, it's probably the same relationship people have with the gym. Uh, where, or, or with travel in general. Is that yeah. Sometimes travel can, can be weird and completely unsettling and disorienting. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But then it's continually rewarding as well. Um, and my, my love affair uh, started... On the West Highland Way, because the second half of the West Highland Way, I my my legs were stronger. It takes a few days, and then suddenly your body starts to kick in. Hmm. I was still sore every day, 
um, I didn't get a blister until I think the very last day. Uh, I made it with in my sandals, um, you know, and I did a face plant, which was I'll probably never forget, you know, just falling face first with this heavy bag on my back, just which really made me go deep into the mud. Um, <laughs> So it was, but you look back on those things and you're like, that was awesome. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so, so just through your attitude, you didn't, your response wasn't, I'm going to quit this forever. No. But it's, it's like, I Even actually like Even through this. the misery, I, I knew it was a learning experience. And I was, even as I was doing it, I'm, I was thinking what I could have been doing better because obviously some of these choices I had made were very, very wrong. Starting at 4 p.m. Uh, on a day with no sleep to start a trek is is crazy. It's stupid. I would never do that now, you know? It was a sin No matter how excited time. I am, yeah. I know that to get the most enjoyment out of it, you wake, you get a good rest, and you start at a good hour, and then by noon or 1 p.m., you're done for the day and you're having a beer. You don't want to be going right to bed, absolutely exhausted, uh, and without that time to to think about the day, and which is also part of the enjoyment. Um, so, having, how many days did it take for you to learn that? Oh, I'm still learning. Okay. You know, you're, you're always learning new secrets. You're uh, you're. There's always something to learn about what you can do better, um, how you can be more efficient, how you can be more resourceful. I think I um, I have some, my own little travel tips now that I can uh, bestow upon other travelers. Uh, some are absolutely quirky and crazy, but I that, and that makes them more fun. Uh, What's an example? Um, well, I think one of the things that everyone does and it's not no secret but still very practical uh take like 25 um uh, freezer bags with you okay. they're good for anything you can get your you can put your dirty laundry in them you can put your uh leftover food in them you can um i ended up on the west island way uh using them to waterproof my sandals, I put them on my feet. Uh, because they're freezer bags, they're, they're thicker than most of the Ziploc bags. Uh, but uh, as large as you can get, uh, Ziploc freezer bags. And that's one clue. One and did thing. you have them with you on your I did. Okay. Uh, these are things I researched okay. before I left. Um, the other thing that uh, I've learned along the way, and I don't know where I learned this, but uh, take tooth floss. Tooth floss? Tooth floss. Okay. Um, it's good for everything. You can floss your teeth with it, obviously, but you can use it for a clothing line if you don't ha have a clothing line. Uh, but I use it for sewing. Okay. It comes in its own spool already, and it seems like an endless supply, and it's incredibly strong. So you, you, you uh, and it's easy to thread because it's waxed. So it goes right through the needle eye, and you can sew, and although it probably doesn't match what you're sewing it on, um, it, it, it's really easy to work with, and it comes with its own dispenser. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's travel tip number two. Right. So, <laughs> Get some tooth floss. <laughs> well, this is, this is great. That, um, I, lo I love the idea that this guy who bought like um, a sleeping bag from the farewell lodge... <laughs> And was completely out of shape. Um, is now this is this is his thing. And so I think this is probably your average person who falls in love with hiking travel isn't the from the womb perfect hiker. It's it's people who learn the hard lessons and they learn to love it. Well, that actually takes me to my second hiking experience immediately after uh, the West Highland Way. Um, I had already planned to do the Camino de Santiago. So within a week, I was uh, in St. Jean Pied de Port, which is the starting point for the Camino Francais. And this is like the walking trip in Europe. Yeah, this is probably one of the most famous 
long distance trails in the world uh, and most popular. Uh, um, uh, I believe in the height of the summer, over 300 people start the Camino every day from St. John, from the border of France. And then more people join in along the trail. Um, and I. And so you had gone from this semi humiliating Scotland adventure. I didn't know and it was this humiliating were... at the time. I didn't okay. know enough to be humiliated. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, now I look back and I'm like, wow, what an idiot kind of thing. Um, but I, I left for Community de Santiago. I started walking, you know, and again, in, your, in my head, these long distance trails was just me on a trail with some trees and birds and wildlife. I didn't know that the biggest part of the trail for me was going to be uh, interacting with all of the other people that were on this walking journey um, from all over the world for every type of reason, from every different type of, with every different type of uh, uh, physical level. And what was your reason? Did you have any religious connection? No. Or is it just this It was Paulo, Paulo Coelho's book. Okay, so a book um, that you read. And while that is somewhat religious, the book is, um, you know, him trying to find his, uh, his sword. Uh, he's on a journey for this spiritual enlightenment. Uh, I, I was, for me, it was um, uh, exercise. It was low, low impact exercise and to see intensely uh, this part of the world that I had read about. And... Um, so there wasn't, there wasn't really a metaphorical uh, motivation. You just wanted to hike this place. I wanted to hike. Uh, and the experiences that he talks about in the book uh, were... A, it was very much about... Uh, dealing with his personal demons as he walked. So uh, I was kind of not, I guess I did know that there was going to be, for him at least, this internal struggle. But he was on a spiritual quest. I wasn't. <clears throat> but I, I, you do have, you, you do get to challenge yourself mentally on these trips because you have so much time to think. Hmm. It's interesting that this wasn't that long ago. This was just four years ago. It was, but I think that now since I've been in Dubai for five, for, for five years now and I've had the opportunity to do these trips for six months at a time. Six uh, months at a time? Well, I mean, I don't travel for the full six months. Uh, for a month in, in the middle, I'm, I'm kind of stationary. But um, uh, in a very short time, I've been able to amass a lot of experiences. So normally I would say, oh, someone with only four years experience at something like this uh, might not have a lot to say about it. But in a period of like, I guess, you know, four, five years, I've got, you know, a nonstop two and a half years on the road. What are some examples of some other places you've been? Because I think... Um... It, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to contrast who you were in Scotland, you know, versus who you have become in the last uh, three or four years. Like, so, so what are some examples of, of some, some walking trips that you've done more recently? <clears throat> um, let's see. There was, I did the Camino Portugues, which is another Camino that starts in Lisbon, and it walks pretty much the entire length of Portugal. Same destination, to, same but different route. Well, there are, the, it, Camino, the Caminos de Santiago are our routes from all over Europe that end in Santiago. So the Camino Frances is the most popular, but there's the Camino Portugues, there's the Vino, uh, Villa La Plata, um, the Camino Norte, and there's a bunch. Uh, so there, I also had done the Camino Portugues because I had thought that I would save a lot of money uh, walking through, through Portugal because Camino Frances had been so cheap, Portugal's got to be cheaper but I ended up walking with a bunch of Italians uh, who I love dearly but they liked going out for seafood every single night because you're in Portugal right. so why not and that was not that that Leave trip was not to as the cheap. Italians to have the, <laughs> to savor the, the aesthetic every night we were sucking on um, uh, razor clams and and whatnot uh, 
so there's that. Um, I oh Slovenian Mountain Trail, I think. As far as walking experience goes, it's not easy. But as far as walking experience goes, it's probably the most beautiful trail I've done so far. Did you show me? Were you showing me that yes. the other day? So Slovenia Mountain Trail. It's, yes. It's amazing. It's probably nice. it's the first transversal path in Europe. Uh, I think it was uh, created by joining a bunch of different paths together in the 60s. Uh, and it became the official trail of Slovenia a long time ago. So it uh, Slovenians are hikers too. They love to get out and walk and they've got, I think it's over 20,000 kilometers of, of hiking trails throughout Slovenia. <clears throat> the hiking network in Slovenia is also uh, dotted with, I think over 200 mountain huts okay. where you, which are really good for uh, lunch, a, a, a really amazing home cooked lunch, dinner, or beer, or whatever. I, you don't have to have beer, but so you, I tend you stumble to, into this place and you just order a. Well, they're 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 positioned along these trails, and one tip that I learned before I got onto the Slovenian Mountain Trail is, if you Google Slovenian Alpine Association, you can join the Slovenian Alpine Association for about fifty euros, and the you can walk all over Slovenia. And every three hours, you'll you'll hit a mountain hut. And if you want to sleep in the mountain hut, you get 50% off if you join the Slovenian Alpine Association. So your normal 12 euro per night sleep in this, you know, bunkhouse becomes six euro a night. Now it gets a little more expensive if you get to Triglov National Park, which is the Slovenian Alps, uh, but the, the Julian Alps, but in that will be, you know, uh, it can still get to be like 20 euro a night. Uh, and it gets very expensive because they ship everything in by helicopter because there's no roads to get to that altitude. But what a um, treat to, to have. <clears throat> one of the best experiences I've had in walking is Slovenia. It's, it's got all the things that I love. It's got amazing trails, extremely well marked, amazing people, extremely friendly, uh, absolutely stunningly beautiful trails. Uh, and you're not walking on a lot of asphalt and pavement, which some of these trails have you doing. Um, it's all nature and it's really cheap. Like Slovenia is uh, the Alps at a budget. Does anything else compare to this in terms of beauty versus Oh, I'm sure. Yes, there are trails, I'm sure, equal um, to Slovenia Mountain Trail that are out there. I just haven't been there yet. Uh -huh. In Africa, uh, the Simeon Mountain Trail. In China, the Tiger Leap Gorge. Um, there's all of these amazing trails that someday I'm going to get to. Um, the but right now probably the most beautiful trail i've walked so far has been the slivany mountain trail okay oh uh what is it the um oh gosh in south america i'm dying to do the um the what is it the Torres de pain or that oh Torres de pain yeah. yeah that is going to be stunning yeah that, that's a famous one. Oh, and but the thing is is that even though it's so famous you're not going to get mobbed by a horde yeah. of people because it's so far away and so desolate. Yeah. So, but that's an experience I'm, I'm really excited about someday. It's, it's really far down there. Now, what would you tell to someone who, to whom this all sounds great, but they, they don't know where to start. Like they're, they're, they're sub at the place where you were. They haven't even gone to the trailhead to buy their, their horrible uh, sleeping bag yet. How, how would you encourage people to opt for these cool options well, um, of, of walking as you travel? I can tell you that before I did my first trail, when I, obviously when I said that I had read Paulo Coelho's experience on the Camino de Santiago and I thought it would be unattainable because I never thought I'd have the time and the money. Well, eventually I did have the time, but I was shocked when I... Finally, real when I finally learned 
on the trail, how inexpensive it was. For an entire month, you spend roughly about $1,000 because these routes are made for, for pilgrims. So you're spending five to 10 euro a night on a place to stay. Once in a while, it's even free. For 10 euro, you get a massive three course meal and it also includes a bottle of wine that you share with your table. So what I'd like to do and what I, why I ended up thinking I needed to create a blog for, for, for trekkers and walkers in general is to kind of let people know that these things aren't so far out of your grasp. If you want to have one of these rich experiences where you're just on your feet and just, if you love nature and you just want to meet people and you've gone to the big city, you've checked off those iconic images from, you know, uh, that have been in the mass media for so long. Uh, and then you want to get out of that city and you, I encourage you to get out of that city and uh, get into the countryside and find a trail that's recommended by the tourism board and uh, stay in a, a pension and stay in a B&B &B or stay in an albergue or stay in a hostel along the trail and just meet the people because when Are these places hard to find uh, the places to stay. Yeah. The, the, all, all these hostels and albergues and no, uh, well, I find most of mine through hostel world and booking.com. Okay. And you'll find, um, uh, I mean, I found in, in Northern Czech Republic, I found these pensions in the top of restaurants and stuff like that. They're all on, they're all online. You can find them fairly easily. Um, so that, so, but bring okay. a tent just in case, you know, if, if, if you, first of all, you can, if you want to have that camping experience, you, there's more than enough uh, trails where you can camp along the way and actually not spend any money uh, 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 with a place to sleep for the night. But if you're, if you want to travel lightly without carrying your tent, if you want to travel without carrying all your food, there's so many options for that as well, where you can just pretty much carry your day bag and with a few changes of clothes, uh, and your toiletries, and then you're going to be stopping in a village for lunch. You're stopping in a village for dinner and a place to sleep every single day. And there's multiple places between those places to stop for coffee. So and so, this is actually different than the American um, mindset that you're in the middle of nowhere, whereas in in Europe you're hiking places from village to village. The, in America, you've got the mindset that you're going to be in the wilderness for a very long time. Uh, and yes, that, that is one way of doing a trek. Uh, and that is very American. Uh, but you've also got, um, the Eastern European way of, of trekking in there are villages, you know, every few kilometers. And but, this is good for listeners to keep in mind that yeah. actually you can, travel without a tent in some parts of absolutely. the world. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you've got the overpopulated trails. I don't want to say overpopulated because it's just right. The Camino de Santiago, where you're never alone on the trail. You're sur always surrounded by someone is in eyesight. It's, there's, you're never alone, which gives some people a sense of security. Uh, meanwhile, on the... Uh, uh, Slovenian mountain trail, you'll find yourself alone in the woods for hours or the entire day between mountain huts. And honestly, the, the stunning beauty to have that all to yourself and to never once feel in danger of anything because you're on a very smooth trail and it's not like nothing can happen to you, but you're in just as much danger walking through the mall, hmm. you know? And there's no reason to be terrified of being alone in this stunningly, stunningly beautiful place. Uh, there's all kinds of options. There's, um, uh, you know, urban treks where you're, you're, you're doing city walks. And that can take two or three days to actually cover the entire city. And um, are you staying in little guest houses? Yeah, well, you could city. stay in the same place for three nights in a row uh -huh. if that's the case. Um, but there's all kinds of ways to get off your feet and explore. 
I think this is something that is a feature of a place like Europe, be it the Camino or Eastern Europe, that you can go for a hike and actually meet a ton of people. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk about that a little bit, because I think there's this American assumption that <clears throat> you, you hike in the woods to be alone, when in fact there's this sort of group spirit that happens uh, I, in other parts of the world. I think a, one of the things I love most about hiking is the people I meet. Now, I, while I do enjoy you know, those days when I'm absolutely alone in the woods because it's, it is a meditative state and you get to think about all kinds of things. And I mean, at one time I was uh, dealing, even though I was thousands of miles away, I was dealing with the loss of a friend and I had the chance to cry as I was walking, hmm. you know, without feeling self-conscious about it. Um, so to be raw in, a, in emotion. Yeah, you're allowed to do whatever, hmm. you know, you can sing. I, get, I can sing at the top of my lungs and I don't care. You know, nobody cares uh, and I don't think the wildlife is too annoyed with it. Um, it's a very freeing thing. Uh, so, but then at the end of the night, I hope that there's some people, uh, that are going to be sharing my mountain hut <clears throat> and I can talk about where I've been, what I've done. Uh, and that's that second that you have to bond with a few people, uh, over dinner before you pass out in bed that night. Uh, and occasionally if you really, if there's some chemistry with the people that you've met, uh, you'll you'll end up walking together the next day until your paths uh, take you in different directions. So that's happened a lot. And so you end up meeting them five years later. And then you meet five years later and uh, you keep in touch with them. Like the people that you walk with and you have these shared experiences with um are people that you 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 tend to want to stay in touch with um the people the amount of uh marriages that happen uh because of the camino de santiago uh is quite huge actually people that have met walking across spain uh, and they've realized that if they could do this together if (laughs) and they haven't killed each other uh, and they enjoy each other's company through, you know, the pain and the, the planning, uh, and being resourceful together. And you find out you're on the same page with all of that. You're pretty much good to go. And the amount of marriages that have happened because of that is, is quite amazing. It's, it's so interesting at, at many levels that we have all of these apps and strategies to integrate ourselves socially and to get a more spiritual experience of daily life. But there's something to be said for walking, one of our oldest human qualities um, that allows people to do this. They can deepen their relationships uh, with each other. Yourself. Yeah, yeah. And and, and actually you can find emotions, it sounds like, yeah. and, and come to terms with emotions that otherwise you might be att- tempted to just forget about. It was, uh, it, uh, part of walking was also, I think, to have that emotional experience. I wanted to have that self-revelation. And there's, so, uh, it was a very superficial, very egotistical thing that I experienced on my own part. Um, I mentioned this amazing, beautiful woman, Jamaira, that I met on the Camino Santiago. Um, my first experience with her, she was crying. She obviously had had this thing that this horrible thing that had happened uh, in her life, but she was looking at the mountains and she was crying. And in my mind, I was jealous. I was like, "Why does she get to? Ex- ha- why does she get to be emotional? I want to have that raw emotional experience." So I think that I always was looking for that. Um, you can't force it out. It has to come naturally. It was years later on the Slovenian mountain trail when nature did make me cry. Actually, Hmm. I turned a corner and suddenly this mountain range just shocked me uh, to such a degree that I, I had a couple, one or two tears come to my eyes. Hmm. Um, But um, I think that when, when you're going to set off on an epic journey, I think you're looking for some 
kind of um, revelation. I think you're looking, f even if you're not a spiritual person, you're looking to find something in yourself. You're looking to learn something. You're looking to, um, uh, you're looking for, you're looking for an adventure. And I think the true definition of an adventure is, uh, a journey where you're not the same at the end mm -hmm. as you were in the beginning. Um, and that can be a walk across the street, you know, uh, something's changed in your life. And you want, to, I think that people that go on these trips are looking uh, for an adventure. We have a sort of a technological idea of how we solve our problems. You know, there's going to be an app or some sort of device on our smartphone that makes things better. But there's something to be said for waking up every morning and knowing you have to walk, of, of like committing your whole self to something that I feel like a lot of our metaphors for how to deal with modern life take that out of the equation. You know, take that whole physical being um, the, the whole, you, you're going to have to sweat and you're going to walk and you're going to meet new people and you're not going to know how the day is going to end when it begins. And so this is one thing I love about this phenomenon. Well, one of the, I haven't thought about this in a long time, but um, I think a couple of years ago, this was a strong idea I had in my brain. Um, well, I think one of the best experiences you could give to a, a kid um, or someone that's in, you know, that, that early teen years would be to take them on one of these long hikes. Hmm. Because I think that in this, I think in general, we all know that the culture now, people are really spoiled. I, everyone's complaining. I think every generation complains about the younger generation. But I think that the complaints about the current younger generation all focus on people uh, saying that they're entitled or they're waiting for things to come to them or they're complaining about things that they should be thankful for. Um, and what I love about uh, trekking and, and doing multi-day long hikes is that you have to get up and you have to move. It's not coming to you. And the sooner you get up, the sooner you start walking, the sooner you can end and the sooner you can have that beer or whatever it is for a kid would be looking forward to that candy bar or whatever. Um, uh, that's, that's the, uh, that carrot in front of my face. Oftentimes that, that beer I get to get at the end of the trail, but. And often that's a 2 PM beer, right? Yeah. Well, you're done at noon or one, one o'clock, yeah. but the, the idea that you have to stop, start, you can't procrastinate. You can't, wait for it to come to you because if you sit still no one's coming to carry you to the next place right. you have to get up and you have to take that first step and i think that that is honestly if they can learn that they've got to motivate themselves to do that daily thing over a period of a week or a month um, i think that that is a lesson that they will learn and carry with them the rest of their lives that they that someone's not going to do it for you and even if there is someone that's going to do it for you you're not going to be able to achieve what you could achieve if you've done it for yourself this has been deviate with rolf potts more about everything that was just mentioned including links to forrest mallard's trekking website trampasaurus treks can be found in the show notes at rolfpotts.com deviate and as always, you can contact me with insights or questions at deviate at rolfpots.com. This episode was produced by Justin Glow. Cedar Van Tassel does the theme music. Jan Futterman does the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for future episodes of Deviate with Rolf Potts. Mm -hmm.